Thank you. Thank you. And welcome back, everybody, to day six of the Golden Pizza Awards 2014. Yeah, almost done. Tomorrow's the last day. I can't even believe it. But speaking of time frames in this award schedule, you might remember at the beginning when I said that we find it kind of strange that all awards are mechanics based. But that doesn't mean we shouldn't talk about mechanics as a category in itself. I mean, this is what makes a video game a video game. The people who pioneer great mechanics, great ways for you to interact with the world around it, are the ones who are going to craft experiences that feel unique. The kinds that are specific to our medium. The things and emotions and the ways of achieving those emotions that could only be achieved through an interactive medium. It's a very important field and a very wide one too because the possibilities are endless. To win this award, you have to be creative, you have to be open, you have to be insightful enough to realize, yes, this is something that will fit within our world and it will make it all worth it. And that's best why I'm here exploration. to present the award for 2014's Best Mechanics. Best Mechanics. Child of Light. I think we all have a very firm grasp of what turn-based combat is all about by now, which has unfortunately led to some pretty heavy stagnation with the concept. Then along comes Child of Light, which expands on the active time battle system popularized by Final Fantasy, and adds an element of strategic timing to the mix. By striking an enemy at the point where they enter the wind-up phase of their attack, you interrupt the action, effectively buying yourself more time to deal damage before receiving some pummeling of your own. You can achieve shut-out victories this way, denying entire parties of enemies the chance to lay a single scratch on you. Combine that with abilities and allies that all complement this system in their own unique way, and you have a seemingly traditional combat system with some extremely impressive depth. Bayonetta 2 There's no point in being anything but blunt about this. Bayonetta 2 controls like a dream. Combos, dodges, enemy attacks, and every single visual effect caused by any combination of the three all flow in flawless response to what's happening with your fingers on the controller. It's almost like art, it really is. Like mastering a new medium of expression that lets you paint the world in gold-colored angel guts. After a while, it feels effortless. There's a natural rhythm to making Bayonetta perform these over-the-top attacks, giving it an ease of control that anything else in the action genre just cannot compete with. This is one of the few games where even the mechanics can't break the immersion, and that is an accomplishment in itself. Shadow of Mordor when we all first heard of the Nemesis system in Shadow of Mordor, we did not expect it to live up to the promises its concept made. But not only did this game live up to those promises, it surpassed them by a country mile. The way you go about manipulating and subsequently taking down the orc hierarchy is a fascinating process. The game doesn't tell you to hate these guys, okay? The first time one of them kills you, proceeds to mock you about it, and then makes you watch as he ascends the totem pole because of your inadequacy, you immediately want that fucker's head on a flaming pike. And oh, the ways you can go about getting your sweet revenge. Never again will you be more satisfied in a game by dropping a hive full of angry bees on someone. Never again will you be more satisfied raising your own minion up through the ranks only so he can take down that one enemy you just couldn't beat yourself. Never again will you be so satisfied working from the shadows and feeling like you're pulling the strings of the world just by being awesome. That is what the Nemesis system does. Transistor I think people who only played through Transistor once, or strictly played it as an action title, missed out on a lot of what makes it so great. Never using the turn system this game offers is kind of like playing Mario without ever using the run button. You're missing a key component of what makes the gameplay feel so unique. Having to make those split-second calls and tactically planned attacks adds so many layers to every encounter that I just can't imagine going through Transistor any other way anymore. And that's not to downplay the absolutely amazing ability system either, which allows you to mix and match every newly acquired power to either enhance yourself, another skill, or stand alone on its own merit, allowing for a rabbit hole of experimentation you might not even see the bottom of by the end of the game. 
its brilliant, beautiful simplicity, and one more reason Supergiant deserves every bit of praise they can get. Hearthstone, Goblins vs. Gnomes Goblins vs. Gnomes, quite simply, has some of the craziest and most interesting to use mechanics you will ever see in a card game. They bend the rules and buck tradition in almost shockingly outlandish and creative ways, forcing you to rethink how to approach deck building with those kinds of strategies in mind. But knowing of the cards is just the beginning. Playing matches with them and discovering all the unexpected ways they can interact and synchronize with one another is almost just as fun as playing them at face value. It's a game where having your your weaknesses exposed is a learning experience, and a chance to come back next time even stronger and wiser than before. Games, at their core, are about gameplay. We've been saying that for years, and it's a phrase that's still just as true now as it was back in its conception, and it'll probably stay that way for as long as this medium exists. You can get away with bad art, bad story, or even weak concept, so long as the game plays very well. But 99% of the time, you will not be forgiven for constructing a rotten core. To win this award is kind of significant, because it means you mastered what is arguably the most important part of any video game. It's very foundation. It means more than anyone else, you strive to make a game that, at the very least, felt good. Which is all most of us ask of anything we play. So which game this year was the most prominent testament to good design? Which game gave an experience we'd never played before? And the winner is... That's the great master of the world, oh, rum, small and sweet, like flopping fishes. Shadow of Mordor. This game is built around one mechanic, and how it can serve to make that mechanic as fantastic as possible. Without the Nemesis system enhancing the player-driven events in this game, it would merely be an Arkham clone with a Middle-Earth skin. But with a whole army of orcs to take down, and an ever-expanding array of tools to do it with at your disposal, it becomes something extremely special. Think about this, Shadow of Mordor is a game where even your failures make the experience more interesting. How do you even begin to do that? I'm invisible! This has nothing to do with the award, by the way, but considering my original footage looked a little something like this, we're all just gonna have to deal. Best soundtrack. Best soundtrack. Transistor. Freedom Planet. Shovel Knight.
Donkey Kong Country Tropical Freeze. The Binding of Isaac, Rebirth. Sorry for the general silence there. The way we see it though, we could have listed any number of reasons that each soundtrack was great by itself, but in this one awards case, the work should stand alone. Whether you're talking old music or new, it's the quality of the talent behind the music that will always decide how good or bad it is, no matter what instrument set you're working with. Melodic, ambient, dissonant, energetic, loud, soft, or what have you, no one approach is the silver bullet to this kind of thing. To craft a soundtrack for an entire world, you need to have a world of skill, capable of producing the right type of song for any situation that needs it, making this both an incredibly hard field to work in and a particularly impressive one to shine within. But only one soundtrack can shine the brightest. And the winner is... Transistor! What sets this one over the top is the flawless vocals of Ashley Barrett. I sincerely hope this woman finds more work in the industry, because her soft and powerful tones and tracks like The Spine and We All Become are just gorgeous, much like the world you traverse in this game. It's a cyberpunk state of social betrayal and political intrigue, and yet there's a layer of class and sophistication to it all, like a fancy club where everyone you know is in suits and gowns, gathered to drink of the finest champagne, and hear Red sing one more beautiful yet haunting tune. The soundtrack cements that feeling to the very last note, and Transistor would feel so much less complete without it being exactly the way it is. This is it, guys. The last day of games you might not have tried. There's no room for it tomorrow because Day 7 is the big one, the game of the year. So I mulled for quite a while about what to talk about. Should I make mention of Hitman Go, another fantastic mobile game that succeeds through how little it tries to emulate its big console counterparts? Should I throw some love at Unlimited World Red for being one of the better anime games to come out in a while, or spend two minutes talking about Drakengard 3, which is glorious on the sheer grounds of how little it gives a shit about appealing to a massive audience and just does things in its own subversive way? Actually, I think there's a lot more value in asking you guys. We're just a small group of people at the end of the day, with a limited view of the industry as a whole. Therefore, we think asking you what are some of the most surprising games you played this year are could help broaden everybody's perspective and get some healthy discussion going on. After all, we're all here for the same reason, love of this medium. So let's share some of that love with everyone else who might have missed out. 
I'll see you tomorrow, everybody, for 2014's Game of the Year.